Hi, my name is Roy Collin and welcome to the show. I've also got five podcasts, The Awakening Podcast, Exposing Fraud and Corruption but with Solutions, The Crypto Podcast, Talking About All Things Blockchain, NFTs, Crypto, The Meditation Podcast, Talking About All Different Types of Meditation, but there's also meditations there from one minute to two hours. And the other one is the Learn Polish Podcast, so if you're interested in learning Polish, you can do that. And the other one is speaking with Roy Collin, and I just have guests from around the world talking about either public speaking or also about their book or just general life in general. And you'll find everything on bio.link forward slash podcaster. I'm also a podcasting coach. And you see the QR code there, and it's also on my link as well. And if you're interested in actually going on some podcast shows, I'm helping people doing that. Or if you're interested in sponsorship, you can contact me. And I'd like to thank my sponsor, DanielPacker.com. He helps people with anxiety, stress, and addictions. He's got a 90% success rate, and you only pay if you're successful. So be sure to check him out, DanielPacker.com. I hope you enjoy this week's show. Welcome to the Speaking Podcast. You can find all our episodes on SpeakingPodcast.com. My guest today, co-founder of Emirates Empire Partners, but he's worked with the likes of Tony Robbins for something like 15 years. John Asarap, I, I've actually met him. I don't know, am I doing his name justice? Plus a few more, but I'd actually prefer that you'd actually introduce yourself further and your career because it's fairly impressive. Please welcome Brooke Bishop. Yeah, I'm sto- stoked to be here. And uh, yeah, I've gotten to work with some fascinating human beings over the course of time with with challenging names, nonetheless. But uh, yeah, and I, I got to work with Tony Robbins for uh, actually before Tony, I worked with another Irishman. So I worked with a gentleman named Brian Buffini. So he's from from Ireland. And uh, is he the real he, estate guy? Is he? No, he is. Yes, he is. Okay. Yep. So he, he emigrated uh, many, many years ago, I think back in the 90s. And uh, him and his family moved over stateside. And they were real. So he got into the world of real estate. So real estate sales trainer. So actually, that's where I got my early years. I cut my teeth with Brian and his brother, Kevin and John and, and Dermot and all the, the, the whole Buffini family. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, that was my early piece of the career. And then from there, I, I got recruited and picked up by Tony. Um, so I worked with Tony Robbins for 15, uh, 15 years, which was just a, a wild ride working with him and obviously speaking I mean, big, one of the biggest names in the world of, of public speaking and biggest stages I've, I've ever seen um, in terms of where he's played. But uh, yeah, I, I, it's just been a, an incredible space in the world of personal development, speakers, trainers. Um, yeah. Life changers. So um, it's been fascinating. Excellent. So before we delve into all that, there's a few things I say because I love when I see somebody that's doing something better for you know volunteering or stuff like that. And I saw that you're doing a support operation underground railroad. There's a few different things you're doing the Surf Finder Foundation, but and Feed America. So I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, we, we've actually added a few new. So um our company is called Empire. Uh, you can't see it on my shirt, but it's on my shirt. <laughs> um Empire Partners. Uh we we actually help coaches or world changers transform their business so that they, they in turn can go help more people. Um, but part of that uh, with the company called Empire. So if you've seen Star Wars, so there's Empire Strikes Back. We have a, a whole part of our ecosystem called Empire Gives Back. And so part of, of what we do for anyone who decides to work with us, we donate and we support a number of different charities. Um, so you, you've named a few. So Operation Underground Railroad actually they go in and help remove uh, children and uh, people for that matter now, but um, from sex slavery. So they go in and do sting operations and rescue operations, um, which is just beautiful work that they're doing, helping helping save these kids. Uh, the other one you mentioned, Surf Rider Foundation. So that's something we, we do locally. Um, one of our, our founders, he's in San Diego. So they do a ton of beach cleanups. So that was something that was really near and dear to his heart. And then the big one that we've just added in, we actually do uh, one of our companies, one of our partners is called coaching assistance. So for people who need, uh, whether it's VAs or they need an admin or they need somebody who supports their sales team, every time we place a, a coaching assistant, we also are paying for a child in an orphanage in the Philippines to have three months worth of, of food. So doing some some really good work. So we're we're able to help the people that are helping people, and in turn, we're helping more people. That's basically the. Yeah, I love the that. I, I think when you're doing things like that, 
you know, it no longer be, no matter what you're doing in life, it's not a job. You know, you're making the world a better place. I wish everybody was doing that because if they were, we wouldn't be seeing the things and especially the trafficking. I mean, I know that's terrible and it's, it's, a, it's a massive, like most people, they just kind of turn their heads and pretend it's not happening. But I think once you actually get involved and try to help it, that's the only way that we can do because the exposure and everything is, is, is totally the way agree with you. Yeah, that totally agree. So there was something else I saw there. No, it was about the parenting, passion, passionate. You have three kids, passionate parenting. You might explain that. Yeah. So th this could, this might be four episodes worth of, <laughs> depending on how far down the rabbit hole we want to go. Uh, so a number of years ago, my wife and I, we, we were living in San Diego as well. Um, there was a, one of the weeks my son came in and he goes, Hey dad, where are we going shopping this weekend? And I was like, what do you mean? Where are we going shopping? And he was about four years old at the time, maybe five. And I'm like, that's just a weird question. He goes, well, every weekend, that's what we do. We go shopping. And he's like, I was wondering where we're going shopping. And I'm like, this is not what I want him to be thinking of. Like, it was just not the right anchor that I wanted him to have. And so my wife and I, we, we really started just having deep conversations and we, we got to the point where we said, this isn't the way we want to raise our kids. And we, we were very much, um, misaligned with the way that the world was telling us we needed to raise our kids. So what we actually did is we, we gave everything we owned away, well, virtually everything, pretty much everything away, but we gave 98% of our belongings away and we sold our house, we sold our vehicles, and we actually bought a fifth wheel, uh, travel trailer and we took our kids and we went and traveled for two years. So we traveled all over the U S we traveled, uh, outside of the U S in Costa Rica and Mexico, Hawaii, um, up to Canada, like we, we went all over the place. And uh, that, that started us to really down this road of, or, you know, with when it came to schooling our kids, we're like, well, why are we putting them in school? What do we think about the school? Well, if we were to go back in time, would we go back, back to school? Well, so just started opening up just these new uh, answers, I guess you would say, um, you know, being that you're, you're in a different part of the world there, that in Europe, right? You cross a country line. It's like, these are the rules now. This is the language. This is the side of the road you drive on. This is what you can or can't do or what you can and can't say. And there's this imaginary line that's there that determines these fictitious things that somebody made up at some point in time. And so that really just opened up our eyes in terms of how we were parenting our kids and how we were raising our kids when it came to food, when it came to the clothes we wear, when it came, like we literally went down to like, why are we using this soap? Like we got into the nitty gritty and what came out of that is we really took a step back and we went, okay, well, if we were going to build our own philosophy of parenting, instead of just following the status quo and just saying the government says you have to do X, Y, Z, we kind of flipped the bird and we went, mm, let's do it our, our own way. So what we do um, from a parenting or an education perspective, whatever our kids are passionate in, we immerse with them in their passion. And then we teach from that vantage point. So uh, to, to put context around it, um, my son, he got really into anime. So like Japanese cartoons. So within that, we got into Japanese cartoons with them and we turned off the, the American dub. And so he learned how to read by reading subtitles. So by the time he was six years old, he could read really fast and he could read literally anything. And he taught himself how to read because he was passionate about it. Well, then we got into the history of anime and who are these artists and what are the stories behind the stories and the, philo the philosophy and the spirituality that's in it. And then like, then we started going into Japanese culture and then we started going into like, so this is kind of the, the thought process is that we love as human beings to learn when we're passionate, when it's forced, we don't retain very much. And so that's, that's really the, the core ethos. And so when he's no, when he was no longer into anime, he pivoted into, uh, into martial arts. And so then we went into the Korean history. And so that's just kind of the, the philosophy that's, that's around that. Yeah, I love that. And I've heard that there's something like 2 million now in the States that are homeschooling. Uh, my youngest child, he's, he's 10, they copy the Finnish system. But what I love is they do different languages, they have music, and they don't have to go into the class. That's awesome. I, you know, and it's like, I don't know, it's just like a real positive vibe in there. And like when I go back and think of the way that it was done to us, it's sick. Like cross your arms, put your hand up to your mouth, be quiet. And it was just memory, memory, memory. 
And, you know, like, because my mom was worried, whoa, whoa, how, what about exams and how will he get on and everything? And I said, I am not worried about him. He is 10 times or further ahead when I was his age. And it's like he knows what he wants. And then he'd pivot just like, you know, now he's into the martial arts. He's doing karate and he's doing something else as well. And he's doing the swimming and he just enjoys that. He's programming. And like at one stage, he was doing magic. And he's like, not not for me anymore. And I've learned, don't force it. You go, no, that'll be good for you. This is a bit. And the original way I actually wanted him to do the magic is because I was late getting out of, uh, you know, being, I was very shy. So I was very late to the game. And it was like, he's performing without even realizing he's just overcome the fear of public speaking. And that was That's my, awesome. you know, and it's like, you can do so much for a child, but unfortunately the way 90, 95%, they pass their kid over to the school. No, it's your problem. And they don't even ask them what they're doing there. And it's like, it's not good. Like in homework, I mean, they're in there six, eight hours and then they come back and they have to do homework because they're not spending time with the family and they're not spending time with their friends. And it's all orchestrated to condition you to get into the corporate system, which is kind of a vicious circle. But what, what you're doing, I love it because you're helping others that are kind of doing things. So with the, with the company, there's three of you. How did that all come about? Yeah, so it, it, there's one of my my best friend actually. Him and I have done a number of business projects before, and we've traveled all over the world. And we we uh we actually this might be another piece we want to hook into, but we we have this uh, agreement between ourselves. And so his birthday is coming up this next week, and my my birthday obviously happens every year as well. But we always do one crazy thing per year. It's either on his birthday or on my birthday. So we we've for the last 25 years, we've just done wild and crazy things together. So skydiving, surfing, 20, 30 foot waves, diving with sharks, hiking crazy spots. Like, so we, so we've had this space where we've worked together with different companies. We actually met working for Brian Buffini. That was actually where he first connected. Um, he's a wizard in the world of marketing. So that's, that's his core skill set and his, his genius. I've always been on the side of sale, selling and presenting and on that end of things. Um, and then my third business partner, we actually met working with a gentleman named Russ Rufino. So he's he's in the coaching space and he helps people build their online webinars and funnels and that side. And he's, so his name's Ryan. He's just an absolute wizard when it comes to running and leading um, and building companies. So the, that's, that's kind of how the trifecta came into existence. Um, but yeah, really this specific company that we're, that we're in the midst of, uh, came from just too many people asking us for help. And at first we're like, oh, we don't want to get into that. Like we were doing our own consulting and we just had people that are like, hey, can the three of you help us in this different way? We just, okay, yeah, cool. We can help you build that. We can create that. We can help you navigate. And that literally has evolved into now doing uh, coaching assistance. And we have a we have two different masterminds. We have sales training programs. We have full-fledged consulting. We have an entire marketing agency. And so, yeah, it's been, it, it was really one of those, um, I don't know if since you've got a lot of books there, a book that was just really impactful for all of us. It was called, this or is called The Surrender Experiment from Michael Singer. And so the core ethos of that book is just really being open to whatever the experience is and just surrendering and just stepping forward in faith. And that's what we've done with this, with this business. And it's been very, very cool. Just the, the incredible humans we've been able to connect with, but yeah, that's, that's the, the short skinny version of it. No, oh, very good. So, I mean, you're, the main thing is kind of like helping the coaches become better as such, or like if they're part of a nonprofit that you're helping them have a bigger impact by bringing your three skill sets into their s system. Yeah. As yeah. In, in the coaching space, it's a really, it's a really fascinating uh, niche or niche, depending on what part of the world you're in, how you pronounce that. Um, the people who are so good at helping other people are usually not very good at building and running a business, right? So they have this skill set of they want to serve and they want to help, but then they have this other side of their brain that just, it's, it's not part of the same conversation, which is how do you market? How do you sell? How do you build the structures of a company that's profitable? So that's really the side we help on is we help with the marketing, we help with the sales, we help with the structures and the technologies and that side of the house so that these people who really have a heart to serve can have more clients so they can serve more so they can get out of their J-O-B so that they can serve more of their people and live their calling and live their purpose. Excellent. And with the coaches, because there's, there's all different types and there's organizations, and this is something that you obviously have experience with. One, we know of the people that go away get the three-day course or they just buy the course and they become the coaches, which 
you're competing against that, but I think people can kind of read through the lines. But then there's organizations as well. And I've been involved with different organizations with kind of, you know, like in mechanical engineering stuff like, and project management. There's a lot of organizations, they're organizations just to get the fee. And they're not really serving the people. And it's just kind of like the branding rates and you get the net letters after your name. I'd love to touch for you to touch on that because you would have seen a lot of that. Yeah, there there is. And it's a, again, it's a wild industry. You you can slap a sticker on your door and then poof, you're an expert. Like there's no governing body, right? It's not like you have to go get a PhD and you've gone through all this schooling and you can now have credibility of some sort. Um, so the, yes, there's a lot of certifications that are out there. Many of them are just teaching a specific tool or a specific approach. So depending on the niche, depending on the, the, the industry or the core area of expertise that a coach works in, heck yeah, you, you need to have, in my opinion, you should first and foremost, you need to have results in that area in your own life. That's kind of like priority numero uno. And you'd be amazed at how many people don't have results. Uh, as an example, somebody who's a financial coach, but they're broke, right? And so they become a financial coach because they want to become wealthy because they believe that they can market financial coaching and generate you know, revenue. So you, the first piece, anytime you're working with a coach, you really, really want to know, do they have, do they have fruit on the tree, right? Do they have the results that they're promising they're going to help you get? If they don't have that in their own life, you know, if they're 200 pounds overweight and they're teaching you how to lose weight, that's probably a big red flag, right? So there's this, this dynamic of congruency that needs to be there. Um, but to your, to your original question, there are a lot of really good training programs and there's a lot of really good certification programs that are out there. I'm more prone to the ones that are teaching uh, more of the psychology dynamic because a, a coach, where a coach really comes into play, I think this is a big misnomer in the industry. A lot of people will perceive a coach to be very similar to a therapist, right? So they're going to think like, oh, you're going to do this voodoo mind trick on, on me. You're going to help me with my psychology in this, this realm. The way that I look at coaching is more of, um, it's they're going to help you save time and avoid pitfalls. So if, if we were going to go to the top of Mount Everest, you and I, we could train and we could go learn and we could read books and we could go hike a ton of mountains. And you and I could go to Mount Everest and we could go, great, let's go to the top. Could we do that and survive? Yeah, there's people that have done it, right? Now, if we had a Sherpa, if we had a guide, we're going to be able to do that a lot faster. And there's a real much higher probability we're going to get to the top of the mountains and survive as well as get down the other side. And that's really where I see coaching come into play is, do you have a Sherpa and a guide who has the skill set and the knowledge, regardless of the letters after their name, I want to know, do they have the skills and do they have the results? So that's, that's more of my approach. And again, here's the one other really important piece in the world of coaching. If your coach doesn't have a coach, we have a problem. Because again, they're not eating their own cooking. It means that they're not congruent. It means that they're not going to live by their own principles of what they're, they're going after. And so if they're not consistently growing and if they're not consistently in the game of learning more and you can find out just if you're interviewing a coach, just be like, Hey, well, just out of curiosity, what programs are you doing right now? What training are you currently in the middle of? What books are you in the middle of reading? What, you know, what, who's your coach? If they can't answer those questions, that's a big, big red flag that they're not in the game and they're not congruent. So there's a really long answer. <laughs> no, no, it was a good, good answer. And the other one is because you mentioned, you know, like a lot of the coaches, they're not really good at marketing and everything. When the coach, because this is something I've seen a lot in business, like you come along and you kind of give the marketing advice and tips and everything, but they they want to keep their their style into it. Do you have that? And I mean, I've seen that and it's like, it is hard because I think it's the egos getting in the way and you're going, you don't understand marketing. <laughs> we do, but you're trying to push <laughs> your style onto this and that's why it's not marketing. And then you're complaining. Have you come across something similar? Yes, it, it usually comes out when somebody comes back and they go, it's not working. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Break it down for me. Oh, well, I did 50% of what you said over here, but I'm doing 20% of what this guy says and 40% of what, like they, they make it their own souffle. It's like, well, we, there's a recipe for a reason. Um, you're spot on. I mean, a big part of what we do is anytime we're crafting something, we reverse engineer it. Whereas most people are trying to figure out how to get from where they are to where they want to be. We do the other direction. We go, okay, great. If this is where we want to be, how do we back into that? And so where that really comes up a lot is definitely in marketing. 
absolutely within the marketing space and even more over in the sales space, right? Because we've really narrowed that scope of if you follow these seven steps, you are going to enroll at the highest level. You're not going to have to go out of integrity. You're not going to have to be a slip, slimy salesperson. And when you follow the steps, it works. And we'll have people go, oh, well, you, you know, you told me to say it this way or to do it in this order. And then they, they start moving the pieces around. It's like, wait, until you, and so here's our rule, by the way, until you've done that thing 10,000 times, don't change the recipe, right? Because the recipe is there because it's already been tested and it's already been run through the gauntlet of hundreds or thousands of other people. Just take the learnings from it. It's kind of like our, our uh, Mount Everest example. If everybody goes to base camp and they stay there for a week, there's probably a reason for that. If you don't know what the reason is, that's okay. Ask questions, get understanding about it, but don't just be naive and go, Hey, I'm going to skip base camp. I'm just going to start <laughs> kicking up the hill. Um, but yes, that happens all the time, especially in the marketing space, right? They take the shotgun approach. I know it happens in franchising as well. Like people come in and they think they know how to do it better and they either get kicked out or it just fails and they're blaming the actual, you know, the system. And it's like, they're the ones that actually made the changes. Well, I, so I saw a statistic the other day, specifically on that, that was uh, something like 5% of businesses that start on their own end up being successful and they're around five years later. Franchises have an 82% success rate which is really wild, right? When you think about it, because it's like, oh, if you follow the marketing, if you follow their sales approach, if you follow their systems, per is there any magic in that? Heck yeah, there is. So no, I'd love, love that you brought up franchises because- yeah. <laughs> And like, yep. cause I, you know, you mentioned the, the real estate and everything. Cause I like, I, I done a lot of real estate when I moved to Poland first and I'm big into systems. And I was like, but trying to get people to get on board, is there techniques to stop them kind of getting in their own head that you get them to follow the system because you know it works. Yeah, we're from fortunately for us, we have a background in coaching. So anytime somebody has resistance, we're not seeing it as a, a true blockage, if you would say. We see them as limiting beliefs. So if somebody doesn't want to do something, we see it because they have an emotional resistance that's there. Whereas most agencies or most trainers that are out there, they're just going to try and push harder or they're going to just they're going to push you to the side and they're going to go to the next. From our background, we're, we're blessed in the sense that if somebody has a, an emotional barrier that's there. We're equipped to dig in to figure out, okay, great. What's your fear? Is it a lack of knowledge? Is it a fear of, of what may go wrong? Is there something else? Is there a previous uh, past pain point that's preventing, causing you to pump the brakes? So we'll actually dig in and work through the fears that people have because that's nine times out of 10. That's usually what it is, is a fear. Okay, excellent. So with kind of pre-calls, because I know that's something that you work on as well, because people do, you know, like, uh, let's see if we're a match call and the turn up rate that you make sure that you get a better, because there is a flake rate you know, and on people, you know, some people have a very high flake rate, others have less. So let's maybe touch on that first. How do people reduce their flake rate? Well, for, first up, I want to, I'm going to start calling it a flake rate. That sounds way, way cooler. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, th there's a few different pieces that to, to reduce the flake rate or the, uh, the no show rate. What I, what I see as a big challenge or where I see people make a big mistake is from the point when, in which somebody books an appointment to the point in which they have that appointment. Most people start selling too soon. And this is what usually jumps up the flake rate. So they'll start sending them tons of testimonials of people who have already invested in their program. And they're talking about the end game versus talking about just the next step. So my first recommendation, if you're sending social proof or testimonials from the point in which somebody books, the point in which you're going to be having a sales conversation, you need to be talking about the value of that call, not the value of investing money with you after the call, if that makes sense. Brilliant. I love that. Yeah. All right. Because people will start to sell too soon and it turns people off and then they flake, right? The other part is, um, and I love Robert Cialdini's work. I'm not sure if you're familiar with I'm Robert indeed, Cialdini. Yeah. So Inf part Inf of influence. Yeah. yeah. Influence. Yeah. I have his book, yeah. yeah. So he has this incredible piece. When somebody books an appointment, or he, he talks about it in a general sense, but what we found is very, very impactful. When somebody books an appointment, get them to promise to show up to the appointment. So it sounds really simple, but as an example, so be like, Roy, so I've got you marked down for four o'clock your time this Friday. Do I have your word that you're going to hold that time sacred and you will absolutely be there prepared and ready to dig in, right? 
As soon as Roy says yes, I'm going to go, right, I, know, I need to hear you say I promise. Make it kind of somewhat of a friendly, joking banter. But what we found is that the people who say I promise, they'll usually be in the 90 percentile show rate and they won't flake. So those are just two really good strategies that'll help just improve. Number one, don't sell too soon. Sell the value of, of showing up. And then number two is get the promise. That's excellent advice. Now, the next one is the the, the sale, because I, I hear so many different figures for kind of conversion rate, how many people they need to talk to. And I think some of the times the problem is over salesy. They're trying to push it down their throat without even actually connecting and finding out where the person is. But I'd like you to touch on that one as well. Yeah, the the, the world of, of buyers, the world of consumers has radically changed. Right. And even moreover, since the, the post pandemic world that we live in. Um, so from a statistics standpoint, so what I what I will share with you that we've seen and, and again, keep in mind, I've worked with companies where we've had, you know, three million dollar a month ad spend budget. So or budget for, for our, our Irish folk. Right. But there's there's. Uh, when you're thinking statistics, if you take 10 people that you have a conversation with, there's going to be two out of the 10 that come hell or high water, they will never become a client of yours. Like they never had any intention of buying. They don't have the money. They don't have the mindset. Whatever the reason is, there's going to be 20%, no matter what, not going to fit. Now, on the other side of that, there's 20% that if you, you know, if you let a fart rip in the middle of your sales conversation, they're still going to buy because you have a product or service and they have a painful enough uh, a need on their end that they're going to buy purely because it's the, you have the product, they have the, the need, right? The magic is the six that are in the middle. When you improve your influence strategies, when you improve your presentation strategies, when you improve your ability to connect and to get into their world and to understand and appreciate their model of the world, that's where you become like super powered. You know, you become the magician, like your son, right? You become the magician of enrollments because you have a skill set. And you also have this, this deep resonance of being able to connect with your prospect. That's so what I usually tell people, if, if you're below 20% conversion rate, that means you're selling people away from your product. So your approach is literally shooting yourself in the foot. If you're in that 30%, 40%, up to let's say 70%, you're doing some magical things. Mm -hmm. So I'm, because yeah. what, what I've seen actually is, because I'm always continuous learning as you see all the books and everything. And there was one uh, company that were, you know, doing the coaching, because I do like with the, um, you know, the podcasting, I help people start the podcast and stuff like that. So I'm always trying to, you know, trying to be better at what I'm doing. And so they, they sent some details, bought some little thing and offered a, an hour coaching call, but said no pressure. And we, we we'll see if we're a match. So I had a lot of questions down. I was like, I'll see how good they are. So the first thing he starts off, he said, like, this is going to be a 30 grand investment. Are you willing to invest in that? And I was like, no, you know, I'm not going to spend 30 grand on this. <laughs> and within, I didn't even get 10 minutes out of them. And I just thought it was like, if they had given me so much value that I applied and made them like 100K or whatever, I would come back to them immediately and go, hey, you know what you're doing. I have no problem spending money with you. But the way that they'd done it, it's like, I just thought it was spammy. And I'm just wondering how many people yeah, are doing that, that are hurting people thinking, you know. There, a lot. And, and many of them are creating a black uh, cloud around the entire industry. But no, to, to what you were just talking about prior, what happens is you get people who think they have an understanding of how to do sales. They see a marketing person going, oh, no, uh, no pressure, not going to do X, Y, Z. This is going to be a discovery call, an exploration call. And then you get on and then they do the opposite of what they just told you they're going to do. So again, this is where it can get dangerous, right? This, this is like going to Everest and skipping base camp. You have a lot of people who are going to go and, and they're going to take pieces of the recipe out of sequence. Is it bad that they said it's going to be a $30,000 investment? No. Is it bad that they started with, it's going to be a $30,000 investment? Yes. <laughs> There's, there's been no value exchange and there's been no connection connecting. There's been no understanding here. Here's uh, and this is honestly the biggest challenge in the sales world. If we take it into a different industry, if you went to a doctor and you walked in and they come into the room with you and they go, all right, cool. We're going to do your breast augmentation. And you're like, what? I've got a headache, <laughs> right? 
Like if they don't ask you any questions, if they don't get into, into your world to understand what your symptoms have been and what it's causing and the impact it's having or what your, your pains are, who the hell are they to give you a diagnosis and a recommendation? And then they're going to tell you it's going to cost all this money. So the sequence of things is really important. And this is the other really important piece. If the heart and soul of the salesperson is not aligned with the client and the result that they want, you're going to feel that really quick. So in, in that instance, you had somebody who came in, they were more concerned about making a commission or making money than they were about genuinely helping you. They wanted to know, are you going to be able to invest in what I'm going to offer you? Who gives a rip? They need to know first, what is the problem you're going through? Can I actually genuinely help you? And if I can, I'll, I'll offer you whatever service is going to support you. And if I can't offer that, if I don't have a solution for you, I'm going to be the first person to tell you that, right? So you're absolutely spot on. Yes. If somebody's in alignment, if they're in integrity, they're going to do things in a specific order that's going to serve you as the prospect. And I suppose we can do this as a double question. One is because I see, because I get a lot of people that are coaches come on the show as well, and they offer like 15, 20, 30 minutes, even some do an hour. One, is there a specific or does it relate to the thing? And two, when you mentioned there's like a 20%, you know straight away, should you just like, you should just treat them with respect and just have the conversation rather than good luck. Well, yes. And part of that's in the preparation piece, right? So um, as an example, I've structured my world to where no matter who gets on the phone with me, it could be any one of the 10 individuals. I want to be able to add value to every single one of them because here's why my, where my brain comes in. Do I want to enroll the person that I'm on the phone with? Yes, absolutely. But here's the bigger play. If the average person now knows over 1,200 people, if I serve all 10 of those at a very, very high level, regardless of whether or not they enroll, each one of those knows 1,200 other people that if I serve them, guess what? The law of reciprocity is there. So whether they decide to enroll with me and give me money is, is a moot point. I want to establish a deeper connection and relationship because they're going to go tell 1,200 other people. Or if they're in a conversation, they go to a dinner party and somebody goes, oh, I need to transform my business. I want them to go, oh my gosh, I talked to this incredible bald gentleman from the middle of the United States. You got to go talk to him, right? So there, there's building relationships is really the core ethos of this. It's more of a relational way of doing business. It's honestly what we have to get back to. Um, if we look at what, what the world of the pandemic and what these different things have done, the world became very, very transactional. And in my opinion, that's a very dangerous place to play because we've we've ruled out the human element. We've we've taken away the soul of other people. Like we got to get back to building relationships. We got to get back to connecting and serving our, our fellow man, men and women. If we keep that as our core driver, we're going to build an army of people that want to promote us and they're going to want to send their friends. So it's not just about that transactional sale that happens right then there on the spot. It's about serving the soul of humanity because guess what? They'll go tell 1,200 other people. And then your marketing gets better because you don't have to go spend as much on Facebook, which will bleed you dry. <laughs> and so. I suppose let's touch on on the marketing because like what, I, what I've noticed over the years is, you know, with Google, you, you pay and then it prices that you compete with others. And like I, I have one guy that I'm working with and, you know, he's helping people with anxiety. And his tap just turned up overnight. Like, you know, he was making, you know, like quarter of a million yearly. And then it just stopped. And with Facebook, it's the same thing. Both of them companies have been caught to be fraudulent. But people kind of, like, with the marketing side of things, it's, it's very hard. And it depends on what you're doing. If you're doing something normal, it's okay. But if you're doing something that's against the norm in healthcare and stuff like that, it becomes difficult. So paid, organic, which ones you go you may touch a little bit on that. Uh, it's a really, really good question. So um, we're, our philosophy is we, we call it the Parthenon. So our, our framework, the way that we look at marketing is if you have a one-legged stool and you take out the leg, your, your arse is on the ground, right? So when we look at that was, that was for anyone who doesn't know, that was my Irish. Terrible uh, I, I got it straight away. <laughs> Who's the, <we're> Irish. <laughs> but so we, we look at a Parthenon, right? So if you have eight legs of the, the building holding up the roof, you take out one of the legs, the roof is going to stay up because you've got seven more legs. And so one thing we can guarantee Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Google, these things are going to cost more 
as we go down the course of time. Like a year from now, it's not going to be cheaper. It's going to be more expensive which means you're gonna to have to do one of two things. You're either gonna to have to increase your price to offset that cost or your margin is gonna to start to take a hit. So you're at the mercy of marketing costs, which is a very dangerous game, right? Because we know it's gonna get more, which means we're gonna to have to then charge our clients more, which that means we're, we're put into a quandary of, can we justify it? Does that affect our sales? So when we look at marketing, we're really big fans, first and foremost, of making sure you have a referral base as your core, like the cornerstone of your marketing should always be referral. It just needs to be because it's the one thing that you can deepen those relationships. And if it's the foundation, everything else will be stronger as you go. The other part is the more you're getting referrals, you're going to have a higher conversion rate. You're going to have lower cancellation rate. And the more referrals you have gives you more marketing capital to continue playing the other games. Now, in terms of organic versus paid, big believer of doing both but we recommend people are intelligent when they're doing their paid and their organic. So here, here's how we, here's a strategy. Uh, I'm a big fan of short form content. Why? Because we can pump a lot of it out and we can also get really fast feedback. So TikTok, they're about to get banned from the United States here. But if you take TikTok- Unless you they take, sell you it to someone in America. It's like, <laughs> it's a strange, yeah. The land of the not so free is what we're starting to call it now. But um. When, if you take that short form content, you can go test it on TikTok. You can test it on YouTube shorts. You can test it on your Facebook or your Instagram reels or your, you know, your stories. And that's a real fast way to see what are people engaging with? How many people are sharing it? How many people are commenting on it? That gives you the, the delta to go, ooh, if people are, they connect to one specific piece of short form content, that's your cue to go make long content on that piece. So they need to work, uh, they need to dance together. Um, I'm also not a big fan of just going and throwing huge money at paid and hoping to God that it's going to turn out some huge, you know, miracle winner. We're seeing that, uh, you know, strategies that were used, let's say three years ago, webinars were a huge strategy three years ago that were like crushing it for everybody. Well, now we're seeing it's working in specific niches, but it's not working in others. So what works for one person may not work for your individual offer. So going back one peg, the Parthenon, we recommend referral as the cornerstone or the first pillar. We recommend paid as another, but it should be hinged against your organic. We're also big on email marketing and building up your database and nurturing and adding value to your database, right? So we're also huge fans of doing value add virtual events or even in-person events, depending on your offer. Um, but all of those should be working together. And one month, one's going to work. The next month, a different one's going to work. And so you, you have to have multiple legs underneath your roof. Otherwise, you're going to fall on your arse. So. Yeah, and I 100% agree with you, but trying to tell people that they think that you just do one and it's going to work and it doesn't, you know, they think they throw so much money in one direction and it's like, boy, it's not working. With the referrals then, I mean, I get a lot of referrals based on people that are happy and everything I need never had to pay more, but some people, they pay a percentage. Do you think that's a good idea or a bad idea? And what, what have you seen in that? A really good question you're asking. Um, this, this is going to be like a business course 101. We'd be like 45 minutes, learn everything you can in business. Uh, so with what you're referring to in our world, we call that affiliates or JVs or partners. Um, where long answered your question, heck yes love, love, love affiliates, love JVs, love partnerships. But what I will also throw caution to the wind, if you don't know what your margin is, you can also bleed out. So what I've seen people do as a mistake um, in the affiliate world, by the way, just for anyone who's not familiar with the affiliate world, usually you're going to give up maybe 10 to 20%, sometimes even as high as 30% of your revenue as a referral fee or as an affiliate fee for somebody else to promote your product or service. So why I want to throw caution to the wind. If you don't have 10%, 20%, or 30% margin, you're going to now be paying to sell your product and you're not going to make any money off of it. So you, you do need to know what your margin is and can you afford to give that, that percentage up? If you can, most people that we're seeing in our world, they're, they're usually spending somewhere around 20 to 40% on ad spend to get a, to acquire a client. I'd way rather go give somebody 10% or 20% if they're going to go promote it and bring it to me. Because number one, I'm paying less than I would be on paid. 
Number two, I'm getting an endorsed lead. I'm getting somebody who's handing me somebody who has put their name, their brand, their energy against what I offer. I'll take that all day over somebody who's a cold, cold lead that I paid for on Google or Facebook or whatever. Um, now, one thing you also have to be mindful of, you do need to have a clean way of managing that because the moment you tell somebody, I'm going to give you 20% if you refer a friend or family member, a client over to me, if you don't have a system for managing it and you miss paying out that 20%, they're going to be pissed and they're not going to refer you. They might even bad mouth you to their audience, right? So you need to be, before you go down that road of affiliate, you really, really want to have a clean way of managing it first then let people know you're doing it. And again, just as a reminder, make sure you have the margin the that your percentages are clean and you're not going to bleed out. And it's interesting you said that because um, the last episode I just released was with uh, Jonathan Green. He's written 300 books in, on chat, <laughs> AI and everything. And he, I, I think it was actually, he didn't say it on the show, but when I was doing the research, somebody had, had not paid him um, 2000 on a commission. And he basically blasted it everywhere, told everything. And he said he reckoned he'd cost him a quarter of a million based on what he'd done. And just my own experience, because sometimes I'll, I'll do affiliates and it's brilliant. You know, you get start, some money in your advertising on the podcast or people just find it through the links that you've got. But there was ones that they didn't have a system and it's kind of based on trust. And it was like. I know from all the others, there's definitely leads coming this way and there's nothing come. Oh, let me check it. I get onto my IT person and then they just disappear. And it's like, you're better off working with somebody with, that's actually, it goes through a system. I mean, I know there's guarantees and sometimes, you know, there might be a 5%, depending if it's a product or whatever, you know, because sometimes they're selling stuff, not just coaching, but they're selling things as well. Yeah. And once they know the rules, that's fair enough. But there's a lot of them, they think, yeah, let's get a hundred people out there selling and don't bother paying them. And they think it doesn't affect them. And I think they're destroying their business when they're playing that game. When you, you just brought up a really important piece. And honestly, this for us, our ideal client avatar, right? So if anyone's not familiar with that language, like our target niche client is we want heart-centered entrepreneurs with a high degree of integrity. Why has that become important for us? Because integrity is something that's gone out the window, in, in, in my opinion. So part this goes, this is actually an interesting little full circle moment. For us with raising our kids and not wanting to put them into the the uh, churn and burn education system. For us, the most important piece was instilling values in our children. And the number one value for us with our kids is integrity. So being men and women of their word, standing behind what they commit do, to do. And that's something that, honestly, it's, it's a lost art in business nowadays. So yes, you're, you're spot on. Lead with integrity, lead with your heart. Be real about what you're going to do. If you're in the beginning of your affiliate program and you're like, it's a mess right now, tell your people, hey, I just want to let you know we're just kicking in. It's a mess. Like, so if we drop the ball, let us know so we can make it better, but don't go into it going, it's the best thing since sliced bread. And then you screw over the people who are, who are making you money. And like I mean, with the integrity, I mean, that's something I do with my son. It's like your word is your bond. And when he tells me something that should make you angry or just realize that he's done it, I kind of like, I tell him, all right, you understand why you didn't do that. But I, I appreciate him telling me something. Whereas I wouldn't have even knowing. And with clients, because when I was doing a lot of real estate, I found there was times there was like one was really nasty. He was just just doing all dirty tricks. Now. And when I fired him, it was the best thing ever. There is obviously you've come across that as well. And it comes down to integrity, like you know, turning up as well and just pretending they're doing something. Because for some reason, when you have integrity, you remember things, whereas when they're within they don't they lie and then they'll just kind of and you're going that's not what you said and then it becomes once then twice then i'm just curious what you do yourself with your clients and then how you'd recommend your coaches what to do when they kind of feel yeah we're out of balance here yeah. that you didn't cop it at the start so here, here's the thing you don't have to sell your soul to sell your services like that, that's just the first piece of like you, just because somebody told you it worked one time or you tried something one time and somebody said yes, and they gave you their credit card or their money, like really when you look at how you're doing things, can you go to bed at night feeling that you're in alignment and you're in integrity with, with how you would want things done to you? Um, early in my, my sales career, one of the very first sales jobs I had was selling timeshares. 
Okay. So if you want to look at an industry with a dark cloud around it, timeshares is pretty close to the top of the list, right? Now, it was really interesting. The, the first week that I was there, I heard this guy talking to somebody else who was trying to, to sell them, right? He was a salesperson and they, the, the clients came for their free gift and, and he's telling them, he goes, Hey, if you buy this timeshare, you get free air travel. Every time you want to go use your timeshare, that comes with a free ticket for you and your spouse. And I was like, in the back of my head, I'm going, that's not true. How the heck could, like, not only was it not true, but on what earth would somebody think that it was true to think that you factored in the cost of air travel for two people anywhere on the planet for the, for the rest of time? Like, it was such a, a clear, blatant lie that then the next thing that came out of his mouth, he goes, oh, by the way, anytime you come to the property, you get free alcohol while you're here. And I'm like, what is going on? And so I very quickly assessed that the bulk of people that were trying, or they were the top producers, they were lying through their teeth. And they were swindling people. And I went, I made a decision in that moment. I go, I will never be that person. And so I became the anti-salesperson. So people came on, I go, hey, you're going to probably hear a lot of lies as we walk around the, the property today. And I'll let you know every time we hear one, just so that you're aware of what's being said, because there's a lot of things that are being said that are not true, but I want to make sure you know the truth of how this actually works. And because I was the anti-salesperson, guess what people did? They trusted me, right? Because I spoke the truth in a space that the truth wasn't being spoken. And so in the same thing, when it comes to our coaching businesses, don't promise people that you're going to get them their spouse back, that if they, if they work with you, I'm going to help you go get your spouse back. No, you're a dipshit. You cheated on your spouse. I'm not going to help you get your spouse back, but I'm going to help you become a better human being. I'm going to help make sure you get back into integrity. And if your spouse decides to come back to you because they see you as that man or woman, as the, the person that, that's of integrity, I'm going to help you become better. Like tell them the truth. Don't blow smoke for the sake of just getting a payment. Excellent. I don't know if we answered that question, no, but no, I kind no, of no, I went no, on my soapbox there. No, no, it was brilliant. Brilliant. No, I loved it. Loved it. And finally, you ha you have a book, yeah? The is it the three of you wrote a book? That uh, we did. So here, my shameless plug. Oh, look at me. <laughs> uh, we did. It's called the Coaching Equation. Um, it's also the name of our podcast, by the way. Um, but Coaching Equation is the book. So if anybody is wanting to monetize their message, or if you have a coaching business and you're trying to take it to the next level, that that's really what we what we discuss in there, yeah. And is it at the same caliber of what you shared today? Because you shared gold. Yes, it, it's it's literally the, the Parthenon is something we talk about in there in terms of here's the eight core legs that we mentioned, you know, reference that you should have in your marketing piece. We also have an entire chapter that's dedicated to the sales process. So it's literally the, the recipe that if you mix the ingredients, you get the the jerk who's going to tell you it's 30,000 out of the out of the gate. We show you what steps and what pieces of the recipe to put into proper sequence. And, to, and we also give you the rules of what not to do, which I think can oftentimes be more valuable than what to do. Um, but yes, it's, it's a comprehensive walkthrough of how to market, how to do your sales, and then how to add even more value on the back end. Yeah, excellent. Listen, Brooke, you can let people know how to find you, but I definitely want to get that book myself. And I'd like to get you back because I love what you shared today. It was brilliant. So you might let people know what they, how they can find you. Yeah, and, and and seriously, man, thank thank you for bringing me on and, and just giving me a, a platform to share to share our message with your audience. I'm just super super grateful. I know you you can choose hundreds of thousands of people that I know are knocking down your door to uh, to get in front of your your audience. Um, so I do feel very very grateful and blessed that you brought me here today. Um, but yeah, if, if anyone wants to stay in touch or they want to learn more about what we do, uh, EmpirePartners.io. So empirepartners.io is our main website. So if you're like, hey, you want to see all the different bells and whistles of what we do, um, that's there. Um, anybody who's interested in the book, if you want to dip your toe in the water first and just get an understanding of our philosophy and how we help, uh, if you check Amazon, um, if you just search coaching equation, that's where our book is at uh, and it ships globally. So it doesn't matter where you're at in the world. If you're in Europe, you're in, you're in Actually, I'm sure there's some places in the world that doesn't ship, but anywhere that Amazon ships, it ships. So those are the uh, the two big starting points that we can help support. Uh, yeah. So empirepartners.io and coaching equation via Amazon. Perfect. Make sure I put the link button in the audio in the video. Thank you very much, Brock. Awesome. So well, thank all you, Ryan. No problem. That's all for the speaking podcast. Until next week. Take care. Well, I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Be sure to give us a thumbs up, five-star rating, and share with your friends. And you'll find all my shows with the QR code 
or bio.link forward slash podcaster, as well as my podcast coaching. And I'd like to thank my sponsor, danielpacker.com, helping people with anxiety, stress, and addictions. He's got a 90% success rate, and you only pay if you're successful. Also, if you'd like to go on a podcasting tour, I can help you do that. And if you're interested in sponsorship, you can contact me on my bio.link forward slash podcaster. Until next week, take care.